I'm an environmentalist. Specifically, I'm a conservationist. I run a land trust, Sycamore Land Trust in southern Indiana. Beautiful southern Indiana. <laughs> One of the interesting parts about my job is that I use words like forever and perpetuity all the time. I sit in people's living rooms and I tell them, I can help you save your land forever. That's a heavy thing to tell somebody, right? So I think about the nature of time a lot and what does it mean to make a forever kind of promise? How far back can I think? How far, far ahead can I think? My own personal memory goes back about 35 years. <laughs> This was taken in 1977 in Grand Teton National Park uh, on a very Griswold kind of vacation. It was one of the first days I remember, and one of the best days I remember. It was the day I learned it was okay to pee outside. <laughs> and I peed outside about 15 times that day, and about 15 times every day since then. <laughs> I live out in the country, don't worry. <laughs> but it makes me think, how far back can I think? I can think back about 35 years. With, if I think about my parents' memories and stories, I can think back about 70 years maybe, with grandparents maybe about 100 years. But I can't think back very far, so how far ahead can I think? I don't have children, I have two Labrador Retrievers. Uh, with their help, I can think ahead about a half a second. Uh, about two seconds after the, the close-up picture was taken, that dog had her head buried in a bowl of stew that was left on the ground to cool. Um, which tells you something about the foresight that we both lack, probably. But uh, I can't think ahead very far. Perhaps if you have children, you can think about the day that they graduate, or when they get married, or when they have their own children. Um, maybe if you have grandchildren, you can think ahead a little bit further. But in general, our, our memories are short and our foresight is limited. I use this picture all the time in my work. It's a picture of a sycamore tree taken in southern Indiana around 1930. It's 15 feet across, the size of a sequoia. I find people have a different reaction depending on how I describe it to them. If I tell them this picture was taken about 100 years ago, people tend to think that's a long time ago. If instead I tell them that could be your grandfather in the picture, that doesn't seem nearly as long to them. Two generations. If it was only two generations ago a tree like this lived in southern Indiana, it's not that far-fetched that with certain changes in our values and behavior, something like that might happen again. How do you get a 200-year-old sycamore tree that's 15 feet across? You take a two-year-old sycamore tree that's 15 millimeters across, and you leave it alone. <clears throat> but human beings tend to think in lifetimes. Nature doesn't always operate on lifetimes. Individuals don't always matter as much as they matter to human beings. Take, for example, the monarch butterfly. Monarch butterflies live on average of about seven weeks, and they mate, and then they die. Seven weeks, they mate, and then they die. And every fourth generation, one picks up one day and says, I got to go to Mexico. And that one flies 80 miles a day, up to 3,000 miles, where it overwinters and doesn't mate and die. And then it flies back and starts the cycle over again. Seven weeks, and then it mates, and then it dies. It's the great-grandchild of the previous Mexican visitor that goes back to Mexico every year. Four generations in a year, and an extremely amazing journey. But again, individuals tend not to matter uh, to many natural species like they do to humans. Perhaps because we can, we spend all of our time thinking about individual lives. We think deeply about ourselves and about our parents and about our children. But I'm suggesting that the way that we think about, lives based in li think about time based in lifetimes is incongruent with many of the natural systems on which we depend. And I'm suggesting we become a little bit more obsessed with the future. Not tomorrow future, long future. I think doing that would help us mitigate some of the negative effects that we have on the planet. A man named Stuart Brand, together with his friend Denny Hillis, is building a clock. <clears throat> it's hundreds of feet tall. It's been designed to tell time for 10,000 years. They've been working on it for 25 years. 10,000 years is roughly the age of human civilization, which assumes perhaps optimistically, perhaps not, that we're right in the middle of that. I think that's a neat thing to think about. <clears throat> Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos is funding the building of the clock for $42 million. Now, why would you spend that kind of money on a project like this? Well, these guys liken it to the building of the Great Pyramids. The pyramids connect us with the past, 
the clock connects us with the future, and they hope that it will cause us to think li a little bit more about the things that we do now and their effect on the future. The clock is a symbol of the power of long-term thinking. Why do I think this matters? In 1949, a man named Aldo Leopold wrote a book called The Sand County Almanac. He created something in that book that he called the land ethic, which I suggest is neo-Copernican in its scope. Copernicus, of course, gave us the heliocentric model of the universe, which said that the sun doesn't revolve around the earth. The earth revolves around the sun. Well, it turns out that the earth doesn't revolve around people either. Aldo Leopold wrote in the land ethic that, uh, well, ethics, of course, are general principles for how we behave and how we relate to one another as people. Leopold extended the concept of ethics to include plants and animals and all the non-human members of the natural systems. Together, he called those things the land. Once he set the system that way, he then gave us the rule. A thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. That is an elegant and noble statement of something radical and complex. It literally changes the role of human beings on the planet, from conqueror to community member. It's a big change. <clears throat> in doing so, Leopold sets in, in motion what I believe is a revolution, as profound as Copernicus, and probably more important to our continued existence on the planet. A few years go by after Leopold in, 79, in 49. In 1962, Rachel Carson writes a famous book called Silent Spring, talking about the detrimental effects of pesticides on the planet, and on people, and on birds. A few more, and that galvanized a lot of people. That was a very, very famous book. A few more years go by after that, and then things really start rolling. In 1968, we get the, 1967 and 68, we get the first picture of Earth from outer space. Can you believe that didn't happen until 1967, 68, first of all? But this is an incredibly powerful symbol. It shows us what we are for the very first time. Something small on something big. But even the something big is not that big. It's an incredibly powerful symbol. <clears throat> a, few year, a few more years go by, in 1970, we get the first Earth Day. That same year, 1970, Congress passes the National Environmental Policy Act. That law was written by a man named Linton Keith Caldwell at the desk I get to sit at every day for Sycamore Land Trust. It was the first law, it was the most important environmental law in the history of the world. It was the first law that said the environment matters. When the government is gonna spend government money, it has to consider the environmental effects. Well, that's profound. After that, we get the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act. A few more years go by, and in 1979, the President of the United States, Jimmy Carter, puts up solar panels on the White House. Ronald Reagan takes them down <laughs> two years later, but George W. Bush puts them back up, and Barack Obama puts up even more. Think about how far we've come in such a short time, just a blink of an eye in the 10,000 years of human civilization. 20 years ago, nobody recycled, right? Now you can't throw a tin can away without a 10-year-old giving you the stink eye. <laughs> I suggest the Leopoldian revolution is now. Now, I'm not Pollyannish about this. I understand that there's people, especially as an environmentalist, I will tell you, there are people who are frustrated at the slow pace of the revolution. You know, the consequences of inaction are serious. There's coastal flooding, there's drought, there's famine. Uh, but we can just kick that can down the road a little bit more, right? We've got a lot of time. Tell that to the polar bears and the carner blue butterflies that are right now on the edge of existence, and ask not for whom the bell tolls. It's sometimes easy enough to get frustrated to even think that human beings are just plain bad, and we should just, maybe the earth would be better off shaking off the fleas and starting over. But ultimately, I don't believe that's true. Human be and more importantly, I don't believe it's useful, to be honest with you. Human beings are a beautiful creature on a planet full of beautiful creatures, and we're not going anywhere. Human beings have a right to exist just like any other species. We just don't have more of a right to exist. So what do we do? Everybody always wants to know what we do. Well, my fellow beautiful creatures, my fellow beautiful revolutionary creatures, Leopold said that, uh, I've been using the term revolution, Leopold himself said that the land ethic would happen as the product of social evolution. So let's evolve together. Evolution doesn't usually happen overnight. It happens incrementally as we each take steps to embrace the concept and do a little bit each time and then we pass it on to future generations. 
buy local, turn out the lights, take your kids to a state park, once in a while sacrifice in the name of the cause. But remember, if you're doing nothing, you're doing nothing, and that's not benign. It's like that bottom of the email where you read, consider the environment before printing this email. That's lame. It should say, Con consider the environment when you're living your life, right? <clears throat> but we come closer than our parents, and our children come closer than us. A friend of mine was telling me the story the other day about driving his kids around uh, to some practice or something. They're nine years old. Um, his son Miles and his son's friend, they were in the back seat of the minivan, and they were talking about the next time they had a chance, they were going to catch red-handed whichever one came first, Santa Claus, the Tooth Fairy, or the Easter Bunny. One of those was going down the next time they had a chance. And then a few minutes later, they're going on, ten minutes later go by, and uh, they're discussing the show Cosmos, and the one says to the other how he, how he thought it was amazing that there was a possibility of an infinite number of universes. Now, isn't there hope in that somehow? I think that's so hopeful to me somehow. So be patient, be persistent, and above all, be positive. Nothing hurts our movement more than being negative. I was talking to another friend of mine recently about this talk specifically, and I told him I wanted to be really optimistic because that's how I felt about it. And he said in his heart, uh, he wasn't cynical, but human beings were probably past the past the tipping point. We were, we were already cooked. We are already done for. And I told him, I didn't, I didn't, it didn't really matter whether or not I, I agreed with him. I didn't care. Our course of action should be the same, to do the best we can. The planet might surprise us, and we might surprise ourselves. Change in the way that we think about time can bring us closer to the land ethic by connecting us better to the blue marble. The Copernican Revolution happened over hundreds of years. The Leopoldian Revolution is 65 years old, and we're winning. The Earth doesn't revolve around people, and we know it more every day. We increasingly embrace the notion that human beings are part of an Earth community. We have to continue to try to get better, and we have to continue to pass it on. We must, as the poet farmer Wendell Berry said, practice resurrection. I wish I could be there in 10,000 years to hear the last chime on the 10,000-year clock. Thank you.